okay, wait, people, turn your cameras on. I'm not Hendrik. That's real me. I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> so I really, really, really like if you turn off your, on your cameras because then I can see who I'm talking to. <laughs> and if you're bored and you hate the talk, just show it immediately so that I change something. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Martin. And another Martin. <laughs> All right. Awesome. I guess it's a time. So yes, we cool. continue. Ms. Zara, great speakers for today. It's my pleasure to welcome here Stanislava. She's been uh, the most energetic speaker at one of those conferences where we met. And therefore I keep like feeling I need to invite her again to a conference. And I was really missing this interaction today because this virtual doesn't really give that sense of energy, but I'm super looking forward for her talk now. Your turn. Cool, thank you. So I have several slides and uh, thank you, Hendrik. I just added another slide <laughs> into my presentation, uh, but I, I strongly believe that it's better for you to really understand part of this talk rather than superficially understand everything. So I would suggest to ask questions uh, on the fly and I will make pauses after generally each topic takes one, maximum two slides. So Zuzi and Saurabh, if you see some questions in Slack, I will make pauses after each slide so that we can just converse in the, in the process. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, yeah, I call it let the value stream, the world, the word value stream. I like it because the word stream can be a verb and a noun. And I worked at a company that I left around a year ago and we implemented the company structure in a way, a scaling model uh, that we call value stream. And in my current company, we're implementing kind of the thing that is also called value stream, <laughs> but it comes from a different uh, drive a little bit and from definitely from different level of maturity. So I'm really interested how it works out uh, in my current company. And I decided to talk to you about this thing. And there is one disclaimer really important here that I'm going to use some buzzwords like value stream and dynamic reteaming and uh, OKRs and something else, something else. And some of these words don't really mean in our company the same thing as in other companies. So be uh, conscious about that and cautious about that and ask me more extra questions if you want to understand what exactly we meant by that. So we'll start with an end state and I'll tell you uh, the moment at which we ended in that company. And I left them in uh, July uh, last year, yes, 2019. And I love them because I understood that personally I wanna grow more into a variety of different companies. It was such a nice, comfortable place for me to keep working, but the challenges were becoming a little bit different. So I was interested in kind of less mature companies to help them grow. And I have good friends in that company. And this is the super sad story because the success of the company brought it to almost death. So we were independent company and affiliate of a big, huge company. And this huge, big company first was, ah, you can do nothing. Like you don't even bring any money. We're going to kill you soon. And then we were like, no, we're doing such a cool product. So let's build it together. So we came up to this state that you can see on the screen. I'm going to explain it. And then our big mother company said, oh, you're so successful. We're going to eat you. So right now they are being fully involved in the big company. And I think they will be eaten to death because the culture doesn't scale this way. That just doesn't work like that. It, it works very differently. So it's kind of sad. Our own success brought us to this very weird place. Anyway, what we have. So, uh, and we're talking here about the whole company, like really the whole company. So we have uh, the, the basic, the most important thing are two delivery value stream groups. We call them communities or collectives or yeah, groups of people. They are bigger than the usual scrum team. They are about 25 people. The company itself was about 100. So in the side of this value stream, we have all the people that are responsible to bring a feature from a true beginning to the true end. 
So our company was producing smart thermostats. Smart thermostat has some functionality on the thermostat itself. It has some functionality in the app. It has a lot of data uh, being stored and lots of data analytics and lots of data science behind it. So lots of stuff there. And that was our big problem in all the previous transformations. We kind of want to make the teams responsible from beginning to end. But then you talk about the scrum team size, like max 10 people, and then they just never fit because we have so many different you know, parts of it. So if I have time, I'll tell you later about our three different transformations that we had. And this value stream was the only one that worked. For this value stream, we have one product owner and one backlog. That's crucial. So everyone who works from here just works from the um, from this one backlog that we create all together. So there is no conflict of interest inside of it. Besides the value streams, we have the enablement part. In enablement part, it's, for example, uh, we have this thermostat itself. And uh, we don't own the production line, but we buy it from a special production company, but we need to renew certificates. You don't need certificates for any of your features. It's just a very basic thing, but you need people who do that. So we generally have a small team here who is responsible for that renewal of hardware certificates. Yeah, so it's so independent from the features, everything that is uh, kind of enablement for features that is needed for each feature is inside of the value stream. So this is purely independent stuff. And we started with also 20, 25 people there and we scaled down to 15 while I was working there. And our future hope was to scale down to like five, seven people in enablement, not more. Everybody else in value stream and we were thinking to splitting it in three value streams because each value stream is like a real product. Uh, we really do something that is, again, independent from the other value stream. And separately, we have HR finance sales and second line sales for us was quite important because we were B to B to C. So our sales are selling it to our second B. So we need them being separate from the value streams, but all the marketing and all the UX and all the design. So everything of that stuff was inside of the value stream. And uh, in the end, all the conversations with a, a business client, there were three people there, the business client representative, our salesperson, and our product owner, always. So there is nothing that can be kind of pushed to value streams, right? That's our direct conversation with, with a client. And um, we came there from the real maturity of people. So one of my favorite things that uh, we solved there was the build and run stuff. Because we were promoting the things about build and run, build and run, you were responsible for running the stuff. And I recently spoke about this value stream model to uh, some of developers whom I know personally. And that's the first question they ask. If you have many people in this value stream, who dynamically change working on the features, then who is responsible for running? And you can't believe everybody is responsible for running. <laughs> how can that be? But that's the very important personal maturity level. So how do we work with dynamic reteaming here? And no, I didn't read the book about dynamic reteaming. <laughs> we kind of invented the wheel ourselves. <laughs> and I feel a little bit bad because I still didn't read the book. I read a couple of articles based on this book, but that's on my to read list. Uh, but the concept in our way was pretty easy. So we have these stories, right? Uh, we used OKRs. Uh, so we have clear prioritized backlog from the product owner for the coming time approximately a quarter. So then we say, OK, this first feature, uh, in th that needs lots of design and uh, lots of front end. So Peter is a front ender, and Mary is a designer. And they say, oh, I want to work on this feature. So two of us, or maybe three of us, uh, we're really willing to work on this first feature. Awesome. And we look at the second feature in our priority list. And this is more 
you know, data uh, heavy. So then a couple of uh, data people say, oh yeah, I really want to work on this feature, but we do need uh, more marketing capacities here. So here guys for marketing from the same value stream, right? Who want to join us? And yes, we have more developers than designers and marketeers. So designers were a little bit uh, double agenda, working two features at the same time, but the priority list really helps because they always know that they first help as much as first team needs and only then they need the second team. And it, it, they usually enough time to, to, to do that. But as soon as the first team is stuck, the, this person who is distributing their work, they always first help to the more prioritized team. And when the bug comes, yeah, I know how to fix it, either because I was in the team who built it or because it's still the same product, so features are in a way related. And what was really important on the bug fixing, it was always paired job. So if I am Peter who worked initially on this feature and there is a bug coming in the list, I say, okay, I worked on that like two weeks ago, so I'm going to fix it now. And I pair up with someone who didn't work on this feature, who has the same ability, is also a front-ender or also a data person. And I engage these people and we see two of us and we solve this problem, this bug, so that this person gains the same knowledge. I see some people nodding. I like it. <laughs> so, uh, and again, uh, we moved into this value stream thing out of maturity. So people were generally saying, we are tired of going from team to team, depending on each other, waiting for this. People working in all the like backend stuff, they were saying, I want to see my code working in production. My code, I want to see how it influences the user. I want to know. And because they wanted to know that all these changes, they generally came to they were response, responding to the request from people. Currently, I work in a company where we introduce very similar system, but in order to help people mature. Oh man, <laughs> that works very differently. <laughs> but I really like having this experience. Any questions on that part? So far, there were no uh, questions around. So uh, I have a few which I will ask you at the end. So we have a time to block that. Uh, no immediate okay. questions. See, if you don't have any questions, then I assume you don't understand anything, guys. And then I just stop talking. <laughs> so uh, how we started, what I really like about this thing. So at some point in the company, I mean, um, I strongly believe that one of the very, very important and crucial components of our success was the manager of the whole delivery department. Our delivery department was half of the company. And uh, for the time being, we had one guy being a manager of all those people. And then we didn't have that guy anymore. I mean, he was promoted higher because he's an amazing guy. But uh, what uh, Michael Sahota said once is that you first build an agile bubble and you have some kind of adapters from this agile bubble to the rest of the company, but you need to do something with this bubble because if it stays as a bubble for longer, it rots. And then you don't have agile there anymore because you can't have only the bubble. You need to either the whole company or kind of nothing. So that guy, that manager really, really helped us to break this bubble right on time. So as you have seen on the previous, uh, we, we have this structure so that HR knows how to interact with the value stream and not you know, personal bonuses or something. Finance knows how the PNL is being going through each of these value streams. Sales are collaborating with them. Uh, the second line support uh, always know where to go and how to interact. So there was really not like a bubble here and something else outside, but it was the whole company state of agile way of working and thinking and perceiving reality. But it started with a safe training. You will never believe. <laughs> um, I don't like safe. You all know that, right? So don't kill me. Uh, but the thing was that the first day we were about 15 people coming from all different 
parts of the company. There was a salesperson, a marketing person, a product owner, a couple of scrum masters, a couple of managers, a lead of testers, whatever stupid roles we had at this moment. There was a community of 15 people and the company suddenly said, oh yeah, go have some training. <laughs> and I don't know actually who decided it would be a safe training, but we had it. And um, uh, the first day, you see, we were just sitting at a table and learning all the safe stuff and blah, blah, blah. And the second day was supposed that the same coach helps us to apply safe principles to our real life. And then those 15 people <laughs> met in the morning and said, we're not going to do safe in our company ever. But I mean, here is a coach helping us. So we used the help of a coach of the facilitation part to build something that we want to build. But yeah, I was so happy about these people being together. Like, yeah, it's really too heavy for us. We're a much smaller company. We really like, and we started being this QB model. We are QB. That's what we want to build. And we never came up with a fancy name of that. But that was the moment when I was dreaming personally, you know, very egoistically. I was like, after we implement this super cool structure in our company, then people will call me and say, oh, Stani, you did such a good job at QB. Can you come and implement this QB model at our company? Yeah, nobody called, but yeah. <laughs> See, we're doing the same thing now, I guess. So after this uh, two days of safe training, we came back to the company and then, not immediately, but a uh, short time after, we started implementing the improvement kata. I don't know, guys, if you're aware of that thing, and if you're not, look for that. The improvement kata uh, is a really great thing for short-term, uh, very uh, unpredictable change uh, that falls into definitely complex or sometimes even chaotic domain of Kinevin model. That's something where I know we need to change it, but I have no clue how. And we used almost the same group of 15 people. And our topic was how we can get the feedback loop with the real clients. It was so difficult for us because we were working b 2 b to c So if we just ask our actual like client, the, person, the, the, the company that uh, gives us money, they say, no, you don't need to know anything about the users. Yeah, we manage it. But they are a huge. Uh, you know, company providing electricity. They are a corporate, they know nothing. We can know so much more. So we were during this kata, it was two months kata, meeting every second day, talking about super small experiments. And we came up finally with a lot of uh, touch screen data. When people are touching the uh, thermostat and touching the app, we can immediately see what they touched. And uh, that was really cool. And this thing, working on it with 15 people all together, really led us to this understanding we are QB. We were around 150 people at that moment. We really understood how sales are helping developers. And we had this personal interaction. It's not a salesperson. It's Michael. I work with him every day. I know him. So I can go talk to him. It's so much easier. Even with such a small company, 150, you know, still, just one office space and the rooms in between and sales are sitting on the other side and on the other side we have development they don't even talk to each other come on so this kata was really motivating for people to start this interaction and there was a real clear goal and we had really good retrospective after that and we ran four more different improvement cutters with different groups on different topics and that was incredibly cool i really like facilitating cutters so that's uh, generally what brought us a lot into this understanding of value streams. So that, that taught us this basic, uh, how useful it is to work together. So how we can this cross pollinate from teams. Any questions here? There is one. Do members of the value stream teams in general decide by themselves individually on what to work on? or is it somehow discussed and decided by the whole team? Yes, uh, second one. So inside of the value stream, we have this uh, backlog. Uh, the backlog is uh, approved by the product owner, the real owner of the real product of the whole value stream, but the product owner never does the job again, uh, alone. 
So this continuous flow of ideas that all the team members are bringing, they usually bring it to product owner, then uh, she or he, uh, you know, compiles that together. And because we had OKR cycle, uh, in the OKR cycle, you have that. So the two weeks before the end of the quarter, you have one or two meetings uh, together in deciding which OKRs we really prefer. Uh, first, there is the company OKRs. Then we think about our OKRs per value stream. Then we come up with activities. Uh, then in the beginning of the quarter, uh, as I've described earlier, the people pick up the topics they want to work together. And when the feature is being done, the feature number one, then Mary and Peter who started working on it are free. They can either, both of them together, go to the next free feature. I don't know what it is, number six or seven, whatever. Or they can help the teams who are working on number two and number three if they are able to do that. So, um, and for example, one of the biggest achievements that we had in the proactivity of people was uh, at some point we realized that we have a very high uh, bus factor. So there are some topics that only one person from the whole value stream knows. So we created a matrix uh, with the number of people knowing about the crucial topics for the company and improving the bus factor became our OKR. So the learning sessions, the knowledge sharing, the pairing on the work was included in the, the value delivery work of the value stream. It's not the side job. It's not something we do maybe because, but it's really an OKR and that was brought to totally bottom up by people understanding that I cannot go on vacations for, like we have a guy from Ethiopia, he usually goes on vacations for six weeks because it's far, but he can't because he's the only guy who knows that stuff and he doesn't want to bring his laptop there, you know? So we need to, to really mitigate that stuff. And that was really cool. And what I really liked about all that, when I left the company and I came back there to meet some of my friends like two, three months later, and there are developers telling me, Stani, remember, we created this Excel sheet about the best factor. Now we're really working on it. Look, this. that was so cool. People were so engaged. Any more questions? Yeah, we have some time. Okay. Three team changes. So what happened before all that stuff? So in two years, we had three <laughs> reorganizations in the company. <laughs> that definitely taught us something. So we started with component teams, nice, bright, and shiny component teams. Then just when I joined, we had the change from component teams to component teams. <laughs> I mean, they called it a change to feature teams, but it was not. <laughs> And the worst part of this change from component to component teams was that there was a manager who appointed people to different teams. It was not really one manager, it was a group of people. Unfortunately, even I was involved in appointing people to teams and I said, come on, let's go to self-selection. <laughs> that was really funny. It was my first ever job in my life as a scrum master. So I was working like one week and I was involved in that stuff and I was promoting self-selection. And um, my friends were like, Stanley, why are you doing that? Like, there's so many more experienced people. But mm, yes, it didn't, it didn't work out, apparently, because I was <laughs> so, so much a beginner. So there was a group of people who appointed everybody to the teams. It worked for some time. And then we thought, yeah, that kind of doesn't really work. So in order to make some more feature teams, we can move, like, we can talk to that guy uh, and ask him if he maybe wants to work for another team, at least for some time as an experiment, because just moving one backend guy to the front end team will make it much more feature rather than component. And then we had the new CPO coming to the company, the chief product officer, who said, we're going to make a big change. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's not what we wanted. We really wanted to go baby steps and experiments. Okay, but we couldn't really you know, uh, stop this flow, but we tried to use this flow for our own um, uh, advantage in a way. So uh, we moved into a business domains concept. So we're different teams working for one business domain. 
but the finance distribution there was really weird and the feature distribution was really weird because some features were actually helping both business domains to grow so that was kind of meh um, coming to that one step later and very important thing here about how team how people were getting into the teams into this new team so we get a couple of component teams and a couple of feature teams you know like these features on the on a cake <laughs> they were not really fully featured teams but it was a little bit better they were a little bit closer to the to the customers that's the moment uh, when we started the kata when we really but we already had some teams that can at least in some way be connected to the users so what we did for the people i was still promoting self-selection it still didn't work out actually hr were against that moment now i'll get there <laughs> i'm almost there and what we did in the end was, okay, first, um, we created the list of teams. So this team will deliver this value, this team will deliver this value. Then we went to each developer, trust me, each developer, more than 70, and asked them, what do you think about this team? Teams, you know, composition, like this, the fact of these teams existing. We got some feedback, changed it a little bit. Then we created FTE, per team. Like if this team has this value, then they need some backenders, some frontenders, some not names, but just you know the, the capabilities. We created this list. We went to each developer, asked them feedback about each of these teams. That was really long and kind of nasty and a bit tiring, but yeah. Apparently managers thought that that's our scrum master's job and they were ready to pay us for that. We think we could have done much better job without it. But yeah, we couldn't decide yet. So, and finally, uh, we filled in the names there and then we went to each person and asked them, hey, do you like to be in this team? And there were some changes. And finally, like after many, many, many rounds of talks, we got the people, they were kind of pretty happy about it. So the, I, I would say the outcome was pretty good because we had so many feedback rounds, like what other teams, what capabilities we have in the teams, who is in the team. That was not bad. It just took lots of time. And instead you just have self-selection, half a day and you're sold. So we worked like that for some time. And then in the end we went to value streams and finally we had the self-selection event. And that was really, really cool. Like we still, the majority of people in the company still remember our self-selection day as the big, you know, joyful moment for that. Um, that's a topic of a different talk to tell you how exactly we built the self-selection stuff. Pretty similar to all the other people doing that. So if you want to know, just reach me out and we can talk about that or just read stuff online. I even wrote a couple of posts actually on LinkedIn, which I rarely do about our self-selection process. And uh, that brings it to maturity because people chose themselves. I want to work for this value stream. I want to work for this product. I want to work with these people because there were some changes during the day when like the, 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 the most difficult problem that really was brought up was that we had one guy in, the, in this part in enablement. Uh, for these teams, we didn't have product owners there because they're not products, but we had some kind of tech slash team leads for each of these teams because we need some kind of a lead right there. And one of these leads was kind of toxic person. So nobody generally wanted to work with this guy. <laughs> so like literally two months later, we changed his uh, role in the company and he found some place where he belongs better. Um, so there was some pressure there. It was not all shiny and simple, but, uh, but it was really strong. Uh, moment and people were choosing themselves where they want to go and what they want to do and then they feel their personal responsibility for that so the maturity is growing right there any questions i think i'm just talking too much and people don't have time um, to process it <laughs> well i have a few questions now so one is what was the most important learning for you as a newbie in the role of scrum master Oh, generally, I must say that the biggest thing that I learned and um, I preach it all the time is we need a Scrum Master community or coach community or whatever. Because when I freshly joined QB, I was the person doing it for the first time in my life. I immediately asked, where is our Scrum Master Guild? And we, they officially had meetings every second week, but then it was May 
in the Netherlands, we have some uh, banking vacations there. So this one skipped, another one skipped, and they said, no, that's not going to work like that. <laughs> hey, I need your knowledge. <laughs> so we organized the guild meetings. And at my first company, we had the weekly. And then my current company, we have Scrum Master meetings daily. It's like really daily. And we always have something to discuss. For how long? And yeah, and in my first company, uh, we had an amazing manager who was leading our group of Scrum Masters. We we're all first timers. So we had some hired external coaches for some time. And that was another amazing thing. We had two coaches. Uh, we had a contract with them for four months. And they said, we're not going to work with the company, but we're going to work with you Scrum Masters. We're going to coach you to be able to work with the company. So we're going to pair up for everything that we organize. Yeah, Jurgen, that was really awesome. You probably even know those guys, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, uh, they really uh, brought the level of our group as Scrum Masters. So that's, for me, the most important part. If we believe in what we are doing together, uh, then we can motivate some other people. Mm-hmm. And the second part of it is definitely mature developers. So we had those people who were literally saying, I want to see my code in production. I want to see the reaction of clients, of users to my code. That's why we went to value stream because in backend team, the backend developers cannot see that. They need to wait until this goes through the front end team, blah, 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 blah. And uh, you need this small group of kind of evangelists believing in that stuff and they don't need to do any extra work. They just need to be themselves. And you as a Scrum Master need to talk to them from time to time to remind them, you are guy, you guys are right. Your mindset is the one that we want. Because sometimes you feel, wait, if I'm bumping into this wall again and again, maybe the wall is correct. Maybe I am wrong, maybe I'm broken. And we were giving support to these uh, mostly developers, telling them that yes, Your mindset is what we want to have in the company. And then there were some people whom we managed to hire, uh, to hire really cool guys and girls. And girls, by the way, yeah, there were some really cool girls there. And uh, some people left. We didn't fire anybody, but somehow the environment became unbearable for some people with different mindset. And it helped. Sad to say, yeah, but it helped. (laughs) Well, I have a few more questions here. So did the enablement enablement team give any feedback into the value stream teams or vice versa, or did they do their job more or less in an isolated way? Uh, The work itself uh, is only in enablement because it's isolated. Because if it has anything to do with the features, it goes into value stream. Uh, On the people level, we had yields, crossing that stuff and the guilds were uh, like a backend guild. Uh, there are people in both value streams and in enablement uh, working in this backend guild or uh, um, the uh, middle layer um, guild. So uh, they were on a people level talking to each other, but on the product level, the, the concept of this is that they are isolated. They, they totally don't depend on each other. And Martin is asking, uh, he said that uh, you said you don't have uh, product owners, so how people in the value stream recognize what adds the value? No, no, wait. In value stream, we do have product owners. So we have one product owner for the whole value stream, for the whole group of 25 people. Inside of enablement, we don't call them product owners because it's not a product, right? It's It's a piece of enablement majority technology. So they were called... They were not called actually, (laughs) but if I find some words, it would be rather tech lead. So they still sit with the team and choose what the technical priority of the stuff, but I'm a linguist, so I don't call product owners people who don't own the product. (laughs) In the value stream, yeah, they were like true product owners. So they are not backlog managers. They they really, uh, and that, that was really cool that they had marketing people inside. And we actually at some moment had product managers inside of the value stream. So product managers are not competing with product owners. They are helping. They're working in the same team for the same product. Cool. And you can continue with your talk. 
whatever is okay. next. I have still some time, right? Wait, yes. Where are we? Okay. So one of the really important things here coming back to people was our onboarding. And uh, yeah, you see me being pretty motivating person <laughs> and I really love doing that. So I was doing onboarding sessions for people for like a year and a half. Every month we have two, three, four, five people joining the company, whatever department they are from, I talk to them about Kinevin model, about empiricism, about the gel manifesto. We play games about that. We have almost full hour for that stuff. And we inspire them. And I have later had talks with many of these newbies who were asking, hey, how does this empiricism apply to my job as an HR, as a finance, as a second liner? Uh, how do I orient the Kinevin model better? How does Agile Manifesto helps me to do my stuff if I'm not a developer, if I don't work in delivery department, if I don't work in a scrum team? And I can't stop myself from sharing this story with you. It will be a shorter story because you do know what empiricism is. But uh, this is our product. The product that we were actually, I mean, we were not producing as a production line, but we were writing all the software for that stuff to work. So, and I tell them, so what empiricism is, right? Transparency. So take the thermostat. Our thermostat has lots of different functions. But if we take the very basic function of a thermostat, it's to uh, keep the temperature in your room on a right level. Yeah, that's the very basic function. So we want it to be 19 degrees. We have a tool for transparency, the sensor, right? The sensor that can measure the temperature. So what the thermostat does, imagine that our thermostat in working in project management manner. In project management, we uh, write the program for the thermostat and we put all the data there, all the criteria. So this is the room being, I don't know, uh, 12 square meters. Uh, it's gray in the Netherlands, you know, as usually. And I'm sitting here and I'm alone here and the door is closed. With this criteria, I want to have 19 degrees. So that's the data being put in the thermostat. But what if I open the door? What if my boyfriend decides to come from downstairs to upstairs and enter the room? Then we have more calories going down. Or studies are jumping, which you usually do. <laughs> Or this, uh, you know, yellow thingy on the sky called sun. Have you ever seen this thingy? It, you know, it's bright on the day. <laughs> if that appears, then the, the, the program changes. Do we need to manually change? Oh, now give me the program with the sun. Now give me the program with the open door. That doesn't work, right? So our thermostat is literally using empiricism. So the sensor is the tool for transparency. Then the thermostat is inspecting the situation. Oh, we want 19, but now it's 19.5. And it adapts. It stops heating. Then sometime later, it inspects again. Oh, now 18.5. So we want to heat up. So it adapts. It starts heating. And then I was telling the people, like, even our product can do that. Why can't we as a company do that? Seems so easy, right? So yeah, uh, that was kind of motivational speech. and. Um, I strongly believe that onboarding here is crucial because that's how you step by step gain allies for what you're doing. So you just keep kind of recruiting people to your mindset from the very first day when they don't know what's happening in the company, they're not biased by that's how we do it always. You immediately bring them to this inspirational, motivational, potential of agile we're working. And uh, what I'm doing right now, the same thing at my current company, we always tell them, if you see any inconsistency with that, and you will see inconsistency because that's a lot, that's the, our ideal way of working, that's where we want to be, we're not there yet. But when you see inconsistency, don't leave with that. You know, take it up, bring it up, talk to us. Uh, show us where it's not happening. Uh, make it make it visible, make it transparent, so that we can inspect and adapt based on that. And uh, that brings this responsibility. Jurgen was talking today a lot about why can't just everybody take this responsibility? 
So I think that this onboarding really helps people to take this responsibility. We tell them that it's a norm for our company to be personally responsible for that stuff. Any questions on this? Well, I don't have a questions on this yet, but I have a question on something you said before. That's how it goes yes. here, right? Yes. So um, Ingrid is asking, he told at the beginning that every value stream has 25 members. Yeah. And then you said that people can choose in which value stream they want to work. So mm -hmm. how then do you keep uh, the number of uh, members reasonable? Uh, yeah, that's a little bit not clear in my story. So the self-selection that happened here, that was one time event. So once people chose which value stream they belong to, that's how it happened that we have approximately 20, 25 people per value stream. Later, when we work in value streams, if there is a person really willing to change to another value stream, that's not a problem, preferably a swap because we don't have that much freedom and capability. So if I'm a backender, I want to work on another product, let's talk to my friend, another backender. But to be honest, it never happened. We always gave this option for people, they like keep it open, but nobody asked. Um, and then inside of the value stream, people are dynamically reteaming in three, maximum five people for the items of the backlog. But that's inside of the value stream. And that's one of the big values. Um, yes, I'm repetition here that people really liked that if I work on the first priority and I need help from a person who is working on a second priority, I can just go to him and ask for help because my priority is first and his priority is second. I don't need to talk to product owner. I don't need to talk to whoever. Uh, I know my rights to go and ask for help. And if I'm working on the second priority, I can ask for help from a first priority, but I am happy or I'm ready to hear the no, because we all together participated in the creation of this priority. And we trust our product owner that in the end, she is doing a very important job to, yeah, she talks to the customers. She knows why this is more important than the other one. And the first quarter, our product owner was not that experienced yet, so there was kind of the first three priorities are the same priority. And then there were developers telling her, you can come up with that from your own head, but for our clarity, we need a real list. <laughs> Not one, 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 two, three, four, but one, two, three, four, just tell us. And that really helped. And she learned, that was great. Ingrid, I hope it answers your question. Okay, and the last one that I just added here <laughs> because of Hendrik. <laughs> uh, we had a very similar wall to what Hendrik has. And in our current company, we also have it, we call it Obeya wall. But that's a very important thing that we changed at some point while working with value streams. Uh, we had this wall before as well. Uh, we have, initially we had time. In the vertical columns, we had something like sprints. And in the horizontal columns, we had teams. What influence it has, it means that each team is busy, right? But busyness is not the same as value. So knowing that each team is doing something in each sprint, yeah, okay, kind of nice, but yeah, what's the point? So not without a struggle, trust me. <laughs> there was quite some effort put into that. We moved into this moment. So as I said, we use OKRs. So we have the company OKRs as a horizontal lines, and then we have the work by team and the vertical stuff, and it just changed each quarter. And then we know that each team is adding, and by team here, I mean, this is a value stream, this is a value stream, this is HR, this is sales, something like that. Uh, so uh, each community of people is adding to each OKR and then we had this uh, green, orange, red stickies. So this work for this OKR is going good. We're going to finish it on time as planned and we don't talk about that stuff. If there's any new work appearing uh, out of the blue, some you know bugs or requests like the, the big things, uh, then we discuss them. We had meetings every second week 
It was also open. We usually had all product owners and team leads there to present the progress and everybody else. Yeah, if you're willing to join, just join. And the funny thing is that we moved online before the whole come much before everybody moved remotely because initially we were just having all that stuff on the physical wall, which is nice. Uh, but based on the uh, our office space, we in the end we made the online uh, special tool where this all was visible, kind of similar to Miro, and we were projecting it to the wall during the meetings. So people can see it online at any time. It has its downsides. Uh, I know about them, but at that moment it worked better. So you don't see the, you know, the push information going into your head from the wall. Uh, but uh, during the meetings, you just have it projected on the white wall and it's bigger and you can zoom in and you can, yeah, there was, there were some positive sides of it. So that was kind of fun. But the most important thing is that the work was organized based on the uh, objectives, based on the value and not just teams being busy with something in time. Yeah, actually that's it. Something about me. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, more questions. We still have a little bit of minutes for that. Yeah, can you share a little bit insights about those OKRs? Because I've seen it in, you know, companies are talking about it, but I don't think many of them are successfully implementing it. So if you can share some hints about this. Yeah, for me, uh, so what's important about OKRs is that they give a lot of freedom. If you have key results on the outcome level, then you can always come up with different activities, different outputs in order to make this outcome happen. So in order to successfully implement OKRs, your people should really well understand the difference between outcome and output and what we really care about and what is just the way to get there. I'm currently giving these workshops for Russian doctors. And yes, they all nod, they all love it, but when they do the homework, all the key results are just activities, <laughs> measurable activities, but still activities. So we want to have all the walls being filled in with some signs for kids so that they can do their work themselves without asking 10 hundred times. Yeah, but how do you know that the signs on the walls really help? So your key result is not the number of stickies on the wall. Your key result should be as low number of kids asking. And maybe it stick is on the wall, but maybe it's something else. So this is the biggest problem, differentiating key results from activities. So you need really good coaches, maybe even uh, temporary coaches to really help each team to challenge them and question them how to differentiate the key results from the activities. And so that your key results are really uh, customer driven, customer dependent. So you really see into the real data. And uh, yeah, then it works. And there should be very few, very few. Like in my current company, we suck. That the first quarter we work with OKRs and oh man, <laughs> they are really bad, but that's okay. Like the first quarter having bad OKRs is survivable because you will improve with the time. Thanks. And there was one question uh, from Hanka about how did you concretely proceed to this split of people into some teams? How did you do it step by step? Uh, which teams? At which level? Hard to say. Yeah, <laughs> I was unclear on that, so I hope you will be more clear on that. No, but that's the, that's a big difference, right? Because on the second step, when we had these component and feature teams, then we had like I don't know twenty teams, maybe. Yeah, that, that's based the on base about value stream. On, on value stream, the self-selection means that we have the description on what each value stream will be doing. So we have the separate stand for one value stream, the separate stand for the other value stream, a uh, few separate st stands for each team inside of enablement because they have different topics. Uh, so let's say we have six stands in the big room, right? 
Then we put the pictures, the photos of all the people in the middle of the room and we tell them, put your picture where you want to go. Uh, and we had all the pictures doubled so that if your first choice and your second choice, you can put your second picture right down number two there. So we know that is your second choice. So out of 55 people, we had three people who went to their second choice. I think, I mean, it was tough for them because they wanted to go for their first choice, but I think in comparison of numbers, it's still pretty good. Uh, so the important thing here is that these stands, the flip charts, they present what's the purpose of this value stream? What's the actual product we're working upon? So you can talk to product owner, product owners created these value streams. So that was their responsibility to describe what we're working. They gave motivational speeches in the beginning of this event with pictures and I know <laughs> fireworks, whatever. Hey, come to me, work with me. So that was kind of a lot of fun in the beginning. Yeah, that's how it worked. So you created quite a high level of transparency in that organization, right? So did you experience any pushback? I know you said people left uh, because it was not for them, but uh, did you experience any pushback for that transparency level? Um, yeah, I'm a wrong person to ask about it because I really, uh, uh, I sometimes don't see this pushback even when it's there because transparency is my personal like main value. And I got this compliment from one of the developers when I just joined the company after three or four months, I told him, hey, Mario, our company is so transparent. You can know everything. He looked at me and said, yes, it's very transparent. Two diameter around you. So whenever I come, it immediately becomes transparent. When I leave, <laughs> it stops being like that. So around me, it's always transparent and everybody appreciates it and everybody loves it. And if they don't, I don't notice. So I pretend they still enjoy it <laughs> and I keep behaving like they enjoy it. So, but on the structural level, um, on like at, uh, at this moment, the second one, we had a little bit of trouble with the sea level. Some sea level guys, they were a little bit not really clear. It was not a real pushback, but a bit much of a doubt, which is very understandable. But when we moved to this third level, they give up on us. They said, you do your thing. And then we were very lucky right after this value stream change, or maybe even during this value stream change, we got a new uh, CEO. Uh, it, doesn't really understand agile, like in a sense of, you know, knowledge or buzzwords, but he was doing the right thing. He was really pursuing the value and not activities. And he doesn't care about the hours you work or whatever, but if you bring value, then let's do that together. So that really helped. But the previous CEO generally gave up on us. Yeah, you want to do self-selection, go do that. It's not the best behavior for the CEO. Uh, the current CEO in my company is really supporting and also driving and it really helps, but it's better than being a pushback. Thanks for sharing. So my last question is, what is the one thing you want us to remember from today? Uh, the personal maturity of people can bring you to the state when freedom of choice is rewarding. The people are not afraid of this freedom of choice. That's a lot of freedom of choice in this structure, in the value streams, how they choose with whom they work, how they work, how they choose the type of work they do, how they choose the priority, how they choose lots of stuff. And uh, it took us more than three years to get there. Don't expect your company to be there immediately. But we all really enjoyed being there. And the company grew from financially as well. I mean, there was a real practical growth of it. We almost broke even in just a year of doing like this serious effort. And a year ago, before we started that, nobody would ever believe it. But our OKRs were really very neatly chosen and people were really con committed to do the work. So, but personal maturity plays a huge role there, really huge role. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for inviting me. All right, good job. And uh, there is a feedback in place. 
And also we have a, our second large break for 40 minutes and we'll be back at 6 p.m. Thank you everybody and hope to see you again. And if you need to know something, just write me. <laughs> Thank you.